Good evening. Welcome, everybody. I'm Richard Oliver. I'm the Dean of the College of Architecture at the University of Houston and an RDA member. And on behalf of the Rice Design Alliance, I welcome you to the third of our series, A Material World. RDA would like to thank the Rice School of Architecture and Sarah, Dean Sarah Whiting, for their continued support in the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, for the use of this amazing space. I also want to thank tonight's pre-lecture reception sponsor, the Bronsteins Incorporated. And please take a moment, oh, waiting for the moment, please take a moment when the moment comes. <laughs> I think there's a cue there. There we go. <laughs> yeah, please take a moment to view these sponsors of tonight's reception. As a courtesy to our speaker, I ask that you silence your cell phones and uh, not to use flash photography. This series, The Material World, concludes next week with John Fernandez from MIT. Make sure you don't miss that one. Finally, on uh, November 13th, the RDA annual gala fundraising event will honor a longtime Harris County engineer art story. For more information on that, RDA's future programs, all of them, you can go to the RDA website, www.ricedesignalliance.org. Let me do that again, www.ricedesignalliance.org. And now, I, get, I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker, George Blair. Do, uh, I don't know if you know, we, were, we had a scheduled originally uh, another speaker whose uh, father passed away at the last minute, and, uh, and, and we made an adjustment. But the person who was coming to speak to us comes from the source. And the CEO of that source is George Valerian, so it's even better. Um, George Valerian hails from Alexandria, Egypt, where he graduated from the American University in Cairo, came to the United States and received an MA cum laude from New York University in Marketing and Business Administration. George was born to a family of merchants, so he became one. He opened Scarabius, an innovative retail gallery in Manhattan offering new ideas in home furnishings and accessories, and later the Valerian Collection, a wholesale line of products designed by architects, industrial designers, artists, and craftsmen. He turned his attention to the neglected area of contract furniture, became creative director of the Steelcase Design Partnership, a wholly unique uh, arrangement uh, having so many, made so many products and sold so many products and imported so many products, he became interested in why products were successful and what impact they had on our lifestyles. In 1994, he, he founded Culture and Commerce, a consultancy widely recognized as one of the leading design management agencies in the United States. Representing one of my former students, by the way, Sammy Hayek, do you know them? Uh, in, <laughs> in 1989, George produced an exhibition titled Mondo Materialis. It also has a book, it's, I believe it's still available. Is it still available? Yep. Having put this exhibition together, he became fascinated with the concept of how to make cutting edge materials available to the design community at large. And in 1997, Materials Connection was born. George's passions usually last about seven years. <laughs> he gets the seven-year itch, and he's on to the next project. Uh, he's been on this earth probably as, certainly as long as I have, uh, so you can sort of do the math. Uh, there's been a number of projects, but Materials Connection, somehow, has managed to last, it's in its 14th year, about to end its 14th year. So maybe this is the one. And it has become an extraordinary global materials consultancy and library, providing technology, innovation, and materials to the world of design and to the world's future designers. It's with great pleasure that I introduce George Blair.
thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. One of my favorite cities, and I, it's a great thing you invited me because I hadn't been here in a long time. So it's always nice to be here tomorrow. I'll do some sightseeing. Yes, uh, I, I've hold the record of my own job, holding my own job in my own company. So 14 years is the longest life cycle of any work I've ever done. But um, they've been uh, the most difficult, uh, hardest years of my career. And uh, I think because uh, I invented something that didn't exist before, and. And unfortunately, even though in this country everybody loves creativity, entrepreneurship, there's very uh, few people backing you out there. Banks, forget about them. I hope there are not too many bankers here, but uh, I love bankers, yes, but only when they say yes to you. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, it's been an enormously arduous work uh, Inventing something out of a dream that you get from an idea that you have, and then um, suddenly, I I can say this as my own experience because I know it happened to me. I had this idea, and then uh, everything looks positive. You're so your your neurons just throw you into a positive track, and they. There's nothing that's going to stop you. I'm sure many of you have had that experience. And, um, and so when I had, I, I was my 10th year with Steelcase. They bought my company and gave me a five-year contract, which was really lovely, and I had a great time. And I think I did a lot for them that made it worthwhile for the money they gave me. But my second five years were also just as interesting. and. Then I realized that, wow, 10 years. And just about before the end of that 10th year, I had this vision uh, based on something that I had done for them. It was an exhibition that I had created for them that brought them close to the material, the architectural field, the design community that they were so anxious to make friends with. And it was such a big success. The show was called Mondo Materialis. And I said, you know, we need to do something that has to do with materials. And there isn't a place in the world that has a material library, officially, where you can walk in and find materials, research things, like a real library. And that's how this, my career path for the last 14 years took me. I created something that didn't exist and all I knew was that I didn't have cash flows, money, nothing, zip. And that was contrary to anybody who's been to business school. <laughs> I mean, here I am, a business graduate from New York University, son of a very prominent Armenian family of merchants for decades. And here I am studying something with just a, a feeling, um, um, uh, uh, just a strong, strong feeling, inspiration, uh, and hope. And so, and this dream has been going on and going on and going on and going on. And uh, I don't know if you believe in science. I'm a Leo by birth, but it's not the type who works so hard. I think, but. I like to give orders. And <laughs> <laughs> However, I succumb to my own orders and I become modest and very docile and I work 14 hours and then I get things done. So that's the story of my last 14 years. I hope this is the last year I'm going to work this hard because <laughs> I'm going to make an exit strategy because, <laughs> because my dream was successful and it's now come to a point where I really feel it has to go on a higher plane. So Material Connection was born in 1987. 90, and it started in the steel case building right on Columbus Circle in New York. They were very generous, gave me free space, they fixed it up for me, 
they um, and they also gave me two hundred thousand dollars and said, "Don't come back for more." <laughs> that was it. And of course, I said, "Fine." <laughs> But the idea was that I, I said to them, you're moving into this new building, nobody's going to come and see you just because you have furniture. Architects don't bother to go 20 blocks just to see a chair. You take the chair to them. But if you're going to spend all this money to do a space with fancy three, four, five floors, you might as well find another reason <laughs> to get them to come and see you. And that was material connection. The library, which didn't exist, so they trusted me, and sure enough, it was wonderful. We had so many people showing up. We had receptions, parties, and it was overly successful. So basically, at last, and after four years, we got so big that we had to move out of the building. <laughs> so the whole idea sort of lasted for four years. And ever since we've been growing, we went to another location, which we stayed six years, and then Last year we moved finally to Madison Avenue, so now kind of we made it sort of a big time. But each time we were uh, faced with adversities. First, of course, it was the World Trade Center and the collapse in September 11, was it right? And uh, every time we made a move, we had another crisis, whether it's a financial crisis, a world crisis, whatever, what have you. But with tenacity, we're where we are. So Material Connection was born um, in 1997. And what I'm going to show you is a, a little bit uh, um, what happens in the system. So I'll push you to the next slide. Um, the idea was that even though today's speech is about architecture, so to speak, but it really isn't. We are a company that serves 10 disciplines. So basically, I call each discipline, we mean each, each trade. Interior design is another one. Uh, fashion is another one. Art, fine art is another one. So each one of these are people that we like to serve. So my feeling is that we go back in history and you see where things started with materials and we start looking at the historical evolution. I mean, we can go back to the Egyptians and we can go back to clay, to Stone Age. I think that should be reasonable to see here because we don't have five hours. It's not, it's not a history of material development, but basically I want to bring you up to speed to where we are now. Uh, the Eiffel Tower was a major departure with its construction of steel. Then we have the building which is right down the block from me now, is the Flatiron Building, which was the uh, first sized skyscraper in reinforced con concrete. Then we have the nylon that was developed the year of my birth, so you know my age. And <laughs> this is the DuPont nylon, uh, which had become a, a, a euphemism. In fact, in Egypt, uh, anything that's gorgeous, people call it, this is something nylon, they would say in Arabic, hag nylon, meaning it's really super duper. So you know how this has impacted the world, the word nylon. It's really a miracle. And then the Eameses, actually, you know, the, the famous bracing, the, the leg splints that they created also became more known with their furniture for the design community. So we're talking about process and materials and inventions all suddenly. However, uh, the Erosarinen uh, famous tower in St. Louis, which is okay, it's a great <laughs> thing. But I've seen it once. Uh, the Mies building was just fresh and new as I arrived in New York in 1957. It was just finished. It was my favorite place. Down, down, I can't point you, but one side is for 54, the other side is 53. One side has the Four Seasons restaurant, the other side has the famous Brasserie restaurant, which is open round the clock. 
and I used to be a regular hangout there. And when I met my wife, I said I used to be the maitre d' there. I was so well known, and so she believed me. But <laughs> everybody knew me there. But the Werner Panton, who was my good friend, unfortunately died too soon. Uh, created one of the most interesting material products. Uh, Werner was is Danish, but he actually uh, couldn't live in Denmark because he got too many driving violations. <laughs> <laughs> he liked to drink a lot, so he lived, <laughs> he lived in Basel, had a magnificent mansion, and he was amazingly ahead of his time experimenting. This chair, all of you have seen so many times. I remember going through every phase of it. Every year this poor chair got made in another material. So when I saw it at, at my office on this slide, I said, you know, you have to remove that. It's not uh, ABS. It was not that. It was uh, done in Duromer and polyurethane and uh, then they made another material, you sat in the chair, and you fell off it because it was too soft, it was too hard, it broke. So this chair has a huge history. So if you know the business of, uh, of this, the history of this chair, it's really not so simple. But anyway, it's working now, and I really don't know. After 25 years, oh no, 45 years, 60s, right? Anyway, and our friend Mr. Gary, who, uh, my hostess here, my hostess comes from his city, uh, worked on this. Uh, Frank had a little office with two people and worked with other architects and suddenly his brain got kicking in and he became really incredibly smarter as he got older, so there's hope for us. <laughs> and, and Frank uh, actually, when he designed the the boa with the titanium, uh, from what I know, a pretty safe thing to say is that they were able to get the titanium because there was a Soviet submarine that had kind of sunk or something like that, and they were able to buy the titanium at a good price. So it's again about materials. This is the latest jewel, which is not really, a, it's really still Norman Foster's great uh, project for. Mazda City in Abu Dhabi, which uh, uh, for those who read the New York Times a few weeks ago, they actually, uh, I think it's a 60 mile, uh, not even, it's much smaller, I forget now, you have to forgive my old age memory, but the idea of this city is a big rectangle and there are two plots in it which, the whole, the whole, the whole uh, area is, is a, is energy efficient and it's uh, all uh, carbon uh, neutral and all that stuff. So as you see on the text here, it says the project utilizes natural and renewable materials sourced within 800 kilometers, but it's like, it's literally carbon zero, whatever, uh, all the new language that most of you are utilizing. It's not in my vocabulary, so <laughs> don't ask me questions about that. However, they did open the, uh, a section of this. Uh, it's like a little, uh, it's like a, like a housing project where you go in, there are little trains that move, there's, uh, everything is carbon neutral, and the apartments opened up. According to the New York Times, we have pictures, and one of my Associate is going to go and, and, uh, and visit it soon, so I'll send you a report. <laughs> then we have the white aluminum and dark blue glass building. Uh, what are the kind methods of material sourcing for architects and designers? Well, there are trade shows. This gentleman on the right is actually from our German office. He's probably shopping, uh, we have magazines, we have uh, online databases, our own database which is coming up and coming, material classifications, methodologies. Uh, 
The CSI, most of you know, of course, uh, has the general material groupings, then it has the component and systems, like doors and windows. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, what we call the eight categories. We've taken the idea of the material world and simplified it. Right now, who are our subscribers, our members, our visitors? Architects, of course, was my first ambition to see that they are, they are treated well. Architects are very busy, they don't go anywhere, <laughs> unless they're very passionate. Now, I hope they're not all architects here, because probably kill me before I leave here, but <laughs> architects are my best friends, but at the same time, they really don't have time to go anywhere. And so what I told Steelcase that they'd come and see my library was, 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 I think it was well intended. I meant that they would come. And frankly, after all these years, I'm happy to know that it's not only architects that come. So you may feel insulted if I tell you that now, but basically we really are open to a lot of different <coughs> audiences. And I love it when I see hordes of students there. Every day we have groups of 40, 50 students. They just love it. They just don't want to go away. Some of them come from a uh, two days trip from Midwest or from South or North, wherever. It's not a day trip just for the neighborhood schools. So education has become a huge passion for me now. And probably if I start sort of withdrawing from day-to-day -day activities. I'm going to work mostly in the educational side and do programs and things and ideas and all kinds of events because I think we can catch the young spirits just when it's, it matters. The chart of elements, you know, the periodic chart of elements, which has what, 104 elements or whatever, it varies from the who you ask, but I feel that we have thousands. You take that chart of elements and make them into an open field because there are so many mutations and materials today that are unbelievable. So we've, if you see this, this list, the eight categories, we just generalized them into eight. So we had to put a system. So we call them the polymers, the ceramics, the cement-based, the naturals, the carbon-based, the glass, the metals, and then processes. It's not about the material, but it's how it's made and how it's fused. So that's a hugely important category. And of course, as we all know, a lot of products are a mix. So if it's a cement with glass and the cement is 51%, uh, we categorize it as cement. So that's my inside secret to you. So the materials are metals, polymers, ceramics, composites, which is a huge material. This is something we just invented. It's called Active Matter. It's a subscription-based wonderful goodie box that comes four times a year. And in it, we have our creative director and our library directors select some of the hottest news materials and they make arrangements with the manufacturers to supply enough samples for us to create this wonderful curiosity box and with each piece as you see the little tags there are uh, there's an accordion of tags that are basically five copies of the same tag in an accordion file so that you can cut it up and use them, distribute them, what have you. It's a wonderful item, it's doing extremely big success. This is a view of our library. As you see, each of these panels are, uh, um, I think, 11 by 14, and at the bottom, uh, there's, a, uh, uh, there's a little um, tag that explains in three or four lines exactly, basically what it is. Behind this panel is a box, and in the box are additional variations and samples of this, whatever is shown. Different colors, different 
uh, twists, the different models of the same thing, but it's basically the same thing. We now also, there's a code number, we now have of, uh, one of these widgets where you come and you zip in the barcode in the back and the entire information is downloaded into your computer at home. So that's our newest invention. Um, we have right now five uh, other, we have five locations around the world and this coming year we'll probably have 10 more. We'll be like 15 locations around the world. So the ones we now have are in, in New York. It's a you know 15,000 foot library, Bangkok. Cologne is splitting up. I'm going to Germany on Saturday. We're going to open in Bremen and with a partnership with the Fraunhofer Institute, which is the most sophisticated science organization in Germany and Europe. We have in Milan a wonderful space, and we're, we're also very fortunate to find that museums are interested in us. So museums will be hoarding, uh, not hoarding, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, hosting is the word. <laughs> It starts with an H. <laughs> in Milan, we are in the Triennale, which is the most famous design museum. We have a little boutique uh, setting where we can show also, uh, like one man shows or one product shows, where there's an unusual thing with materials. We have a little demonstration there, a little library. But again, the main library is moving with uh, the new branch of the Triennale in Milan. So we have three other museums in the world now in discussion with us. Daegu is in Korea, and last week we were in Seoul, and they're looking to also have a library in Seoul. Now two of these are government sort of sponsored back. It's like in, in Bangkok, it's absolutely beautiful. It's called the TCDC, Thailand Creative Design Center. It's in a shopping mall in a skyscraper downtown and it has uh, amazing design books. It's like thousands. It's like 300 foot long wall with amazing books and beautiful setting with Herman Miller furniture, the most expensive looking place you've ever seen, and the material connection. And a piano, uh, uh, a, um, a grand piano where they have jazz every Friday, Saturday. You should see this Thai people, they have a great time. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a beautiful uh, cafe, there's an exhibition, there's a little museum of design, like it's a mini MoMA, and a big uh, exhibition space which becomes a conference room. So it's a fantastic space. Anyway, to show you that materials have become uh, like like finding the best books of, on design. It's just basically as an inspiration. Um, this is how a closer look of the tabula. The, these are the elements that classify and file away a material. And we have 5,000 of these in the 12 years that we've been around. When you see that full library that in the previous slide, that's about 2,000. So you can imagine, we only keep really a select 2,000 instead of all 5,000. First, we don't have enough space or rich enough to have all that real estate, but basically we edit the most important, significant things so that the visitor has a, an idea so you know about the categories, and um, what do we inform? We have the home page, we have the advanced search page, we have the product page. These are all amazing things that uh, uh, we have tons of people working on all these things, and don't ask me questions. So, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But it, they, these things bore me, but this is what you have to do to grow a business, and as you all know, you, everybody's very technical. But sam sampling, uh, the uses and limitations, can access to material samples limit creativity? Yes, 
Designers make an immediate aesthetic connection to a sample before understanding materials' technological attributes. The idea we work on is that we take a piece of glass, and everybody thinks it's going to be a, a glass to put on top of a table. But what we like to do is not tell you that it's for a glass for a table, so that you can start using your imagination. So it's really, for lazy people, for lazy minds, it's not a very easy process. But it's really wonderful, because after a while you get used to it. You stretch your creativity, your imagination, and you start saying, oh my god. Because we're so standardized country, everything we do is because the law says so, because standards have said that there should be so much proof of that, so much proof of that. So we are very tied to a rigorous standard, and we like the idea of opening the boundaries. Uh, so we basically are delivering 10 years in material innovation at this moment, which actually is more. And what we do is we create activities that are obviously corporations and love us because when like a Johnson & Johnson comes or when some major company comes, they come with 14, 20 designs. So we're not allowed, I'm not allowed, I have a big mouth and so they tell me to shut up. But we have some enor enormously important clients like in Sweden, people that you've heard of very much, which are, we're, we're tied to confidential agreements. So we go there to do workshops and to teach them things, but it's very ironical because we fly to Paris, one day we're with the McDonald's group, the next day with the Hermes, such an incredible contrast of clients. One does hamburgers, the other one does incredible leather products on thousands <coughs> of dollars. So it's all basic denomin common denominator is the material. Here's a packaging, I mean, we got so much coverage on this that the Puma people got jazzed that we, we got the, the products so <laughs> visible. But this package is beautiful because it saves them several million dollars uh, by creating this little cardboard simple structure and this cute little bag and it's a wrapper and then the wrapper uh, at the end on the right corner uh, makes itself into a little uh, uh, loop that you can lift the package from. And it's, it's just wonderful. And then inside are the shoes. Chilovich was another incredible case. Like, people think vinyl is terrible. Well, we know why. But basically, there's a company down south uh, that ha makes this ugly PVC. If you see this material, you'll really recognize it maybe. They make those cheap beach chairs that are $4 at the supermarket. And they're vinyl. That's the worst name you could use in our vocabulary, of especially our green minded folks who hate vinyl. But we all know that, okay, it's not the. So I'm the worst guy to represent my company when this kind of a speech because <laughs> I'll probably give all our. Uh, they tell me to shut up, but nobody <laughs> wants to hear that vinyl. I'm, I'm promoting vinyl here, but Ms. Jelovich has made a fortune creating company out of this material that I used on those cheap beach chairs. And uh, when we had a, uh, an, our annual conference, uh, she was awarded uh, uh, one of the ten prizes because of her creative use of the material. So she got up on the stand just like me, and she took out a flask of gin, and she put it there, and everybody laughed. And then they said, she explained about her success. She found this material in the library, and she's a very clever lady. She had another, other uh, hosiery company before, and she sold it for millions. Again, I won't go into detail how she invented that company. But she came one day, free woman had nothing to do, and she found in the library this little tacky vinyl that's woven. It's like one of these here on the roll. And before you know it, she was at the gift show, the furniture show, the Frankfurt show. She made placemats with them. 
the, all she did was she cut them up and she went to the factory and told them to stop making those ugly colors of green and yellow. And she said, make it in chocolate with silver or make it in such beautiful, elegant presentations. She was a merchant with style. She has, I'm sure, a multi-million dollar business and I'm not covering her, I'm complimenting her because when she got the award, it's because she took the material and made it into something. She made it into an industry. Wherever you go, you'll see her products. I'm sure 90% of you here have seen her products. And when somebody finally, after her speech, Mr. Cocky said, all right, what about the ecological things and about the vinyl? And then she was expecting it. She had the ball of gin there. And she said, listen, young man, you know, uh, I have a product here which actually is used every day and people eat off it and they smear it with tomato ketchup and all this stuff. All you have to do to clean it is to get a wet sponge and you mop it and wipe it. We don't put it in a washing machine, we don't put suds, we don't waste water, and everybody cracked up, laughed, and applauded. She got the award anyway. So <laughs> just to tell you how we take things to extreme sometimes, and we get hysterical. Nike. Uh, here's a Nike Air Jordan. This shoe, as you see here, is the uh, Jordan shoe. The, the, how, I mean, this is 10 year old, but we just got released and able to show you this because we're not allowed under secrecy. We don't divulge what we consult with. So this flap, as you see here, is actually a hose that they thought would be great to use on the flip as a, 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 of the shoe. So the hose, when you splice it, it kind of gets flat and it becomes like a woven product that's flat. It's a monofilament sleeving, as they say. This is another experiment with the BMW, the Gina, which was, uh, again, purely uh, a story because it was just a visionary shape-shifting sports car that is actually light grass stretched over a wire aluminum frame. And then I want to move before I keep you here all night. Uh, some of our latest materials that this was, uh, this year we started an award program. And this one got the first, first prize. It's concrete cloth. It's a piece of cloth that when you simmer it with water, it becomes concrete. So ima imagine what incredible applications, especially for emergencies and earthquakes and for artists to use this and shape it, drape it, and then you have a piece of art. The, the aero from forms and surfaces with corrugated, anodized, and wonderful things they make. The sensor cell, which has these LED panels that illuminate when you motion, they kind of reflect. And 3D laser engraving, so you actually see the image in the glass, in the material, the polymer sheet and the Ombre system, which has a Queen Metal Arts and Sciences company, produces this technology that allows complex designs to be embedded directly in, into any solid material. This is the uh, beautiful Lamelock where uh, the wood is in, has an incision and is embedded with, with resin and you have light going through. And the power glass, with German laminated panels that incorporate LED lighting. So it's, this is a, not new uh, anymore, it's five years old. It's, uh, it's a Lucon and has various sources available now other than the original one, but it's concrete, which has glass fibers embedded so you actually see through, uh, see through or have light coming through it. You can't see it because it's not transparent, but you see uh, as just like this image is. We now have wood that has, which we don't show here, uh, wood with incredibly tiny holes in it, and then, uh, and then you, 
and you can see through the tiny holes, the light comes through. I just picked these up, they're not, you're not supposed to see them because it's supposed to be in our next book, but I cheated, so being the boss, I thought I could get away with it. So I just wanted to show you, since we were an architecture group here, what new things have been happening, 18 foot tall spines or self-supporting glass. These are molded in such a way that they're reinforced within the planes of glass, um, amazing. And um, the East Beach, East Beach Cafe, it's a steel monocoque and structure made of sculptural layers of mild steel chosen for resistance to sea air. This is the, right in New York. Uh, it's the beautiful Cooper Union building by Tom Main of Los Angeles. Must be your friend, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful, uh, you, you will know how really lovely it is when you get close to it. It has this, uh, like an Arabian veil over the building, and it's, it's, it has enormous functions. It's not just a decoration. Uh, Again, these egg-shaped uh, glass panels that uh, are known as slumping, they, they, are, they add stiffness to the, to the facade, and they also look terrific. This is in Istanbul, which I intend to go and see next month. And uh, this is, a, uh, who went to Shanghai? To the World Expo, I bet half of you did. You used to people, what can I say? Uh, Everybody's very wealthy in Houston, right? <laughs> uh, so I didn't go, so I, didn't, I couldn't tell you anything, but it uh, seems that it's, and I'm gonna miss it also, but they are uh, made of concrete. So the last parting words would be a little material innovation goes a long way. And uh, I end my slideshow here because uh, it's now 10 to 8, and I think everybody's hungry and wants to go and have dinner. And thank you for listening to my picture. something profitable, you make it profitable. So far, uh, we have only had one bad year when, the, you know, we've been through five economic slumps in the last 12 years. And last year probably was the worst, and we may have lost $200,000 or something like that. And But we managed to stay above board uh, each year. Uh, we're now at a point where the business is very interesting, but it's positioned where it has to blossom in a huge way, and I don't want to do that myself anymore. So the company is very attractive, and is, several companies worldwide are looking to uh, acquire it. And so I'm hoping this will be my last year running the company although I intend to stay with it and make more exciting things happen, like the educational part, for instance, would be my passion. But I'm a serial entrepreneur, really, because I really feel like my, my idea is to create things and not necessarily just to make money. And I know it's a contradiction, because being a creator uh, is a passion that has very little to do with money. And 
However, I had to make money to be able to subsist and survive and to continue. So we basically have no bank loans and we have managed to survive and throw a profit enough to grow. If I was blessed to be given a chunk of money, let's say still gave me $2 million instead of 200000 uh, I don't know that I would have spent it all. Uh, I think as a lesson, as a businessman, uh, you need to be frugal and intelligent, but I'm one of those people that believe in spending money intelligently in terms of promotion. So who in America doesn't think in promotion? Advertising is one of the biggest passions in this country. And uh, I've never had the luxury of advertising, you understand? Everything that I've done uh, was getting publicity. You do it through promotion, whatever. But we know that uh, tonnage in advertising ends up, not that people who advertise a lot don't go out of business. <laughs> there are lots of companies that have advertised heavily. But uh, uh, public relations, I mean, in, uh, they say there's an expression that says, um, Advertising you pay for, publicity you pray for, so you cannot always get publicity. <laughs> you have to song and dance with the editors, and, and we know lots of editors and they love us because we have something to tell them all the time. So they write about you. But I have a strange feeling that publicity doesn't always really result in sales and that advertising does. It's maybe because I've never had the luxury of spending tons of money on advertising, so I really don't have the luxury to tell you, yeah, that's a great way, and you build up a business that way. But again, uh, if anybody told you you need a lot of money to start something, and that's the only way to do it, uh, that's not true. And so I must say that I'm proud of what we've achieved, and um, I think the idea of having a, an intelligent business is important. To be timely with it is important. And a lot of people have tried to copy and do similar things. But, you know, the bottom line is to be really compulsive. You know, the <laughs> word which starts with an A, compulsive. Well, that compulsiveness is very important in business, I think. I'm that type, and I feel like unless everything is done perfectly, you don't get anywhere. I think there's a communication that comes from management when, you, when they come and see our library, and it's perfection, and everything is done. So uh, maybe everybody will be happy when I move out of the office and not come every day. <laughs> I don't think so. The president who runs my company it's just as compulsive, so <laughs> we hope to continue that way. Any other questions? Thank you.